Okay, good morning, class. Today we have a Q&A, and so we have words that come out. It's 180 to 210. You have psychologically, unwillingness, Caucasian, discrimination, differentiation, Miss Coates, Pat Parks, literature, cognitive, distinction, Valerie, Michelle, Asian, Black, Hispanic. And we'll start at 180, and this is going to be for five minutes, okay? And it starts in the middle. On the second page of those notes from that initial meeting, there is a reference of toes being crushed in both feet. Yes, I had inquired in terms of the nature of her injuries. One of the things she mentioned was the toes were crushed on both feet. Did she ever make you aware that she had never suffered any broken toes in the accident? Yes. Was that based on her discussion with you or based on your review of the medical records? Both. Did you ask Valerie why more than four months after the accident she was still describing her injury as having her toes crushed in both feet? I don't believe so. Did that strike you as odd at all, doctor? Well, at that point, I had not seen any medical reports, and she was walking at that point with a considerable limp. But I didn't know if she had toes crushed in her feet or not. It didn't strike me that she said there were. I was presuming there was a possibility. She may have had some broken bones, so I didn't ask her. You are aware today that the numerous x-rays have all indicated there are no broken bones. Yes. What did Ms. Coates tell you about the situation with her daughter, Michelle? I think that she had originally said in that first phone call to me that she simply wanted to see me and possibly with her daughter. All right. What did she tell you? So again, as a preface to that description of the initial meeting, in terms of her complaints that she registered regarding Michelle, she noted that there was some concern that she had about the degree to which Michelle trusted her, to the degree to which Michelle was affected by the accident psychologically. Apparently, there was some data that she shared with me regarding her daughter's unwillingness to be held by her, to be outside with her. Also, there is much improvement towards staying with the father as opposed to staying with Ms. Coates. Have you ever examined Michelle? No, I've never seen her. Doctor, on page five of your office notes, there is a note referring to Michelle where she says, every time she sees an Asian, she says, that's the bad lady that ran over us. Were you aware that the defendant in this litigation was an Asian woman? I assumed from that statement she was. I was not aware of that. I had gotten her name earlier on, I think, and it's reflected in an earlier note of that same session. Pat Parks is the lady's name? Right, and I was not aware what her national origin was. Do you know whether Michelle actually saw Mrs. Parks at the scene of the accident? I don't know. It's my understanding from later descriptions that Mrs. Parks exited the car and approached Valerie and Michelle. So it's possible that Michelle saw her, but I've never talked with Michelle about that. You are aware that Michelle was two years old at the time of the accident? Right. Do you do child psychology work at all, doctor? Yes. Would it be common in your experience for a two-year-old child to recognize and distinguish an Asian woman from a Caucasian or a Black or Hispanic woman? I never thought about that in that context. Certainly, at that age, children are quite capable of visual discrimination. Whether they would actually identify a different label with those discrimination capabilities in the context of national origin, I really never have been asked that question myself, and I'm not familiar with any literature that's been written about that. So I can't answer that question, except, again, it's a fairly defined cognitive capability at that age. Would your answer be true as well with respect to the ability of a two-year-old to recall many months after the accident, the distinction between an Asian and another woman? I am not sure I exactly understand your question, but let me answer the question as I understand it. And if it's not the way you asked it, let me know. All right. The powers of visu visual discrimination will increase mentally from that time, age two on to age two and a half, say. And again, I am not sure of the literature, if there is any that would suggest that children are capable of cultural differentiation as part of that visual discrimination process. Let me ask it this way. 
it strikes me unusual that a two-year-old child who sees an Asian woman, if at all, only very briefly can recall many, many months after that viewing, not only that Asian woman, but makes distinctions months later between Asian and other women. And I'm wondering if it strikes you as unusual as well. Not unusual in the context of the situation in which there may be some important imprinting of information visually. There has been a lot of research recently around looking at children as eyewitnesses and their capability to recall particular kinds of information. And I'm trying to sort through my head in terms of the ages used there. Just take your time in sorting through all this. There are some instances where children are much better witnesses than adults. And that's contrary to the popular belief that children are also incompetent, are usually. Okay, and so we have words that come out. Let me see. I should have a sheet goes over here. And so does that. And then there's a couple of But do we want that? I know. That's what <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, words that come out, you have suffered, S-U-F-R-D, suffered, S-U-F-R, come back, final D. You have, I don't believe so, Y-O-B-L-S, Y-O-B-L-S. You have psychologically is psychologic and then Lee. Okay, S-K-O-L, come back out, I, and this is going to be 190, you all, for five minutes. On the second page of those notes from that initial meeting, there is a reference of toes being crushed in both feet. Yes, I had inquired in terms of the nature of her injuries. One of the things she mentioned was the toes were crushed on both feet. Did she ever make you aware that she had never suffered any broken toes in the accident? Yes. Was that based on her discussion with you or based on your review of the medical records? Both. Did you ask Valerie why more than four months after the accident, she was still describing her injury as having her toes crushed in both feet? I don't believe so. Did that strike you as odd at all, doctor? Well, at that point, I had not seen any medical reports, and she was walking at that point with a considerable limp. But I didn't know if she had toes crushed in her feet or not. It didn't strike me that she said there were. I was presuming there was a possibility she may have, may have had some broken bones, so I didn't ask her. You are aware today that the numerous x-rays have all indicated there are no broken toes. Yes. What did Ms. Coates tell you about the situation with her daughter, Michelle? I think that she had originally said in that first phone call to me that she simply wanted to see me and possibly with her daughter. And what did Ms. Coates, what did she tell you? So again, as a preface to that description of the initial meeting in terms of her complaints that she registered regarding Michelle, she noted that there was some concern that she had about the degree to which Michelle trusted her to the degree to which Michelle was affected by the accident psychologically. Apparently, there was some data that she shared with me regarding her daughter's unwillingness to be held by her, to be outside with her. Also, there is much movement towards staying with the father as opposed to staying with Miss Coates. Have you ever discussed or examined Michelle? No, I've never seen her. Doctor, on page five of your office notes, there is a note referring to Michelle where she says, every time she sees an Asian, she says, that's the bad lady that ran us over. Were you aware that the defendant in this litigation was an Asian woman? I assumed from that statement she was. I was not aware of that. I had gotten her name earlier on, I think, and it's reflected in an earlier note of that same session. Pat Parks is the lady's name? Right, and I was not aware what her national origin was. Do you know whether Michelle actually saw Mrs. Parks at the scene of the accident? I don't know. It's my understanding from later descriptions that Mrs. Parks exited the car and approached Valerie and Michelle. So it's possible that Michelle saw her, but I've never talked with Michelle about that. You are aware <laughs> that Michelle was two years old at the time of the accident? Right. Do you do child psychology work at all, doctor? Yes. Would it be more common in your experience for a two-year-old child to recognize and distinguish an Asian woman from a Caucasian or a black or Hispanic woman. I never thought about that in that context. Certainly at that age, children are quite capable of visual discrimination. 
whether they would actually identify a different label <clears throat> with those discrimination capabilities in the context of national origin. I really never <clears throat> have been asked that question <clears throat> myself. And I'm not familiar with any literature that's been written about that. So I can't answer that question except again, it's a fairly defined cognitive capability at that age. Would your answer be true as well with respect to the ability of a two-year-old to recall many months after the accident, the distinction between an Asian and another woman? I am not sure I exactly understand your question, but let me answer the question as I understand it. And if it's not the way you asked it, let me know. That's fair. The powers of visual discrimination will increase mentally from that time, age two on, to age two and a half, say. And again, I am not sure of the literature if there is any that would suggest that children are capable of cultural differentiation as part of that visual discrimination process. Let me ask it this way. It strikes me unusual that a two-year-old child who sees an Asian woman, if at all, only very briefly can recall many, many months after that viewing, not only that Asian woman, but make distinctions months later between Asian and other women. And I'm wondering if it strikes you as unusual as well. Not unusual in the context of the situation in which there may be some important imprinting of information visually. There has been a lot of research recently around looking at children as eyewitnesses in their capacity to recall particular kinds of information. And I'm trying to sort through my head in terms of the ages used there. Just take your time in sorting through all this. There are some instances where children are much better witnesses than adults. And that's contrary to the popular belief that children are also incompetent, are usually seen as incompetent as witnesses. Why are children often better witnesses than adults? Often one of the criteria that's associated with that is the actual emotional imprint that goes on in the situation. Children are more likely to recall details clearer in some situations where they have had a heightened state of emotional arousal. Are you talking about all children? Okay, and so let me see. Um, I witness you all is long I N S. Um, I and then W N S. Okay, two strokes, and then you have discrimination. I just discrimination, three strokes. Um, After the accident, AEFRX, AEFRX, and this is 200, you all. <clears throat> On the second page of those notes from that initial meeting, there is a reference of toes being crushed in both feet. Yes, I had inquired in terms of the nature of her injury. One of the things she mentioned was the toes were crushed on both feet. Did she ever make you aware that she had never suffered any broken toes in the accident? Yes. Was that based on her discussion with you or based on your review of the medical records? Both. Did you ask Valerie why more than four months after the accident, she was still describing her injury as having her toes crushed in both feet? I don't believe so. Did that strike you as odd at all, doctor? Well, at that point, I had not seen any medical reports, and she was walking at that point with a considerable limp. But I didn't know if she had toes crushed in her feet or not. It didn't strike me that she said there were. I was presuming there was a possibility she may have had some broken bones, so I didn't ask her. You are aware today that the numerous x-rays have all indicated there are no broken toes. Yes. What did Ms. Coates tell you about the situation with her daughter, Michelle? I think that she had originally said in that first phone call to me that she simply wanted to see me and possibly with her daughter. All right, what did she tell you? So again, as a preface to that description of the initial meeting, in terms of her complaints that she registered regarding Michelle, she noted that there was some concern that she had about the degree to which Michelle trusted her, to the degree to which Michelle was affected by the accident psychologically. Apparently, there was some data that she shared with me regarding her daughter's unwillingness to be held by her, to be outside with her. Also, there is much movement towards staying with the father as opposed to staying with Miss Coates. And have you ever examined Michelle? No, I've never seen her. Doctor, on page five of your office notes, there is a note referring to Michelle where she says, every time she sees an Asian, she says, that's the bad lady that ran over us. Are you aware 
or were you aware that the defendant in this litigation was an Asian woman? I assumed from that statement she was. I was not aware of that. I had gotten her name earlier on, I think, and it's reflected in an earlier note of that same session. Pat Parks is the lady's name? Right, and I was not aware what her national origin was. Do you know whether Michelle actually saw Mrs. Parks at the scene of the accident? I don't know. It's my understanding from later descriptions that Mrs. Parks exited the car and approached Valerie and Michelle. So it's possible that Michelle saw her, but I've never talked with Michelle about that. You are aware that Michelle was two years old at the time of the accident? Right. Do you do child psychology work at all, doctor? Yes. Would it be common in your experience for a two-year-old child to recognize and distinguish an Asian woman from a Caucasian or a Black or Hispanic woman? I never thought about that in that context. Certainly at that age, children are quite capable of visual discrimination. Whether they would actually identify a different label with those discrimination capabilities in the context of national origin, I really never have been asked that question myself, and I'm not familiar with any literature that's been written about that. So I can't answer that question, except again, it's a fairly defined cognitive capability at that age. Would your answer be true as well with respect to the ability of a two-year-old to recall many months after the accident, the distinction between an Asian and another woman? I'm not sure I exactly understand your question, but let me answer the question as I understand it. And if it's not the way you asked it, let me know. That's fair. The powers of visual discrimination will increase mentally from that time, age two on to age two and a half, say. And again, I am not sure of the literature if there is any that would suggest that children are capable of cultural differentiation as part of that visual discrimination process. Let me ask it this way. It strikes me unusual that a two-year-old child who sees an Asian woman, if at all, only very briefly can recall many, many months after that viewing, not only that Asian woman, but make distinctions months later between Asian and other women. And I'm wondering if it strikes you as unusual as well. Not unusual in the context of the situation in which there may be some important imprinting of information visually. There has been a lot of recent research around looking at children as eyewitnesses and their capacity to recall particular kinds of information. And I'm trying to sort through my head in terms of the ages used there. Just take your time in sorting through all this. There are some instances where children are much better witnesses than adults. And that's contrary to the popular belief that children are also incompetent are usually seen as incompetent as witnesses. Why are children often better witnesses than adults? Often, one of the criteria that's associated with that is the actual emotional imprint that goes on in the situation. Children are more likely to recall details clearer in some situations where they have had a heightened state of emotional arousal. Are you talking about all children in this context? No, it's been my experience in some of the children who I have examined who were victims of either physical abuse or sexual abuse but there is some distortion in terms of their capacity to remember. Okay, and um, I did write a uh, scene of the accident is S-N-E-X. Scene of the accident, S-N-E-X. And this will be at 210 and then we'll have your test, okay? There it is in case you all wanted to see it. Five minutes. On the second page of those notes from that initial meeting, there is a reference of toes being crushed in both feet. Yes, I had inquired in terms of the nature of her injuries. One of the things she mentioned was the toes were crushed on both feet. Did she ever make you aware that she had never suffered any broken toes in the accident? Yes. Was that based on her discussion with you or based on your review of the medical records? Both. Did you ask Valerie why more than four months after the accident, she was still describing her injury as having her toes crushed in both feet. I don't believe so. Did that strike you as odd at all, doctor? Well, at that point, I had not seen any medical reports, and she was walking at that point with a considerable limp. But I didn't know if she had toes crushed in her feet or not. It didn't strike me that she said there were. I was presuming there was a possibility she may have had some broken bones, so I didn't ask her. You are aware today that the numerous x-rays have all indicated there are no broken toes? Yes. What did Ms. Coates tell you about the situation with her daughter, Michelle? I think that she had originally said in that first phone call to me that she simply wanted to see me and possibly with her daughter. All right, what did she tell you? So again, as a preface to that description of the initial meeting, in terms of her complaints that she registered regarding Michelle, she noted that there was some concern that she had about the degree to which Michelle trusted her, to the degree to which Michelle was affected by the accident psychologically. Apparently, there was some data that she shared with me regarding her daughter's unwillingness 
to be held by her to be outside with her. Also, there is much movement towards staying with the father as opposed to staying with Miss Coates. Have you ever examined Michelle? No, I've never seen her. Doctor, on page five of your office notes, there is a note referring to Michelle where she says every time she sees an Asian, she says, that's the bad lady that ran over us. Were you aware that the defendant in this litigation was an Asian woman? I assumed from that statement she was. I was not aware of that. I had gotten her name earlier on, I think, and it's reflected in an earlier note of that same session. Pat Parks is the lady's name? Right, and I was not aware what her national origin was. Do you know whether Michelle actually saw Mrs. Parks at the scene of the accident? I don't know. It's my understanding from later descriptions that Mrs. Parks exited the car and approached Valerie and Michelle. So it's possible that Michelle saw her, but I've never talked with Michelle about that. You are aware that Michelle was two years old at the time of the accident? Right. Do you do child psychology work at all, doctor? Yes. Would it be common in your experience for a two-year-old child to recognize and distinguish an Asian woman from a Caucasian or a black or Hispanic woman? I never thought about that in that context. Certainly at that age, children are quite capable of visual discrimination. Whether they would actually identify a different label with those discrimination capabilities in the context of national origin, I really never have been asked that question myself, and I'm not familiar with any literature that's been written about that. So I can't answer that question except, again, it's a fairly defined cognitive capability at that age. Would your answer be true as well with respect to the ability of a two-year-old to recall many months after the accident the distinction between an Asian and another woman? I'm not sure I exactly understand your question, but let me answer the question as I understand it. And if it's not the way you asked it, let me know. That's fair. The powers of visual discrimination will increase mentally from that time, age two on to age two and a half, say. And again, I am not sure of the literature if there is any that would suggest that children are capable of cultural differentiation as part of that visual discrimination process. Let me ask it this way. It strikes me unusual that a two-year-old child who sees an Asian woman, if at all, only very briefly can recall many, many months after that viewing, not only that Asian woman, but make distinctions months later between Asian and other women. And I'm wondering if it strikes you as unusual as well. Not unusual in the context of the situation in which there may be some important imprinting of information visually. There has been a lot of research recently around looking at children as eyewitnesses and their capacity to recall particular kinds of information. And I'm trying to sort through my head in terms of the ages used there. Just take your time in sorting through all this. There are some instances where children are much better witnesses than adults. And that's contrary to the popular belief that children are also incompetent, are usually seen as incompetent as witnesses. Why are children often better witnesses than adults? Often. One of the criteria that's associated with that is the actual emotional imprint that goes on in the situation. Children are more likely to recall details clearer in some situations where they have had a heightened state of emotional arousal. Are you talking about all children in this context? No, it's been my experience in some of the children who I have examined who were victims of either physical abuse or sexual abuse, that there is some distortion in terms of their capacity to remember some of the details. Okay, and we'll get ready for your test, okay, you all? Okay, so we have test number one, 200 Q&A, Dr. Darst. Medical American Medical Association, and that's it. You all. Well, you gonna... well, let me make a copy. Okay, sorry, oh, no, no, already. No, no. You know what? I I I saved it in my computer. Oh, okay. So I'll just make another. And copy. then I added. Her. Oh, because she'll come back. Oh, okay. okay, I'm trying to read. Okay. There's people contacting me about okay. the merit class. Okay, so this is going to be then your test number one, two hundred for five minutes. You all it starts in the middle. Is there any other reason that you can't work or can't sit for more than two hours at a time? I get muscle spasms in my lower back and around my shoulder blades. And I get real tense in the neck. And then I get a really bad headache. These events or these symptoms follow one another as you have just described. You get the muscle spasm, then you get the headache. Yes. Usually I get the muscle spasms first and then I get a shooting pain and then I always have like dull ache in the back of my head. Do you mean 24 hours a day? I have got a headache right now. And you reached behind your head just now and pointed to some part of your anatomy behind your neck. Can you turn around and show us what you were pointing to? Right in this area, I have like a dull pain constantly and change of weather stress. It seems like it gets real bad. And then I get like somebody's got my head in a vice grip and they just keep turning it. 
Okay, and how long have you had these symptoms? Almost two years. Okay, and how often does this scenario occur? That is the muscle spasms to the shooting pains to the headache. It's about 75%. 75% of what? Of the time. I don't really know how to answer that question. 75% of the day, 75% of the 24 hour period? Yes, unless I take real good care of myself. So approximately 18 hours per day you have these symptoms. That's the muscle spasms to the shooting pains to the headache. Well, the muscle spasms and the headache. The shooting pains aren't 75%. How many percent are they? About 30%. Of the 24 hour day? Yes. Do you have days when you have no symptoms? No. Never? Not that I can recall. From the day of the jailing, how many days elapsed before these symptoms started? Could you repeat that, please? From the day of the jailing, do you know when this did occur? What date the incident with the police and the jailing? Yes. Can you tell me when that was? October 9, 1989. Okay, from October 9, 1989, when did your symptoms first occur? That night. I had no centralization, though, of pain. I hurt from head to toe. You were sore. Or what do you mean by hurting? I felt no sore. It was worse than sore. Intense pain just from head to toe. Can you describe the kind of pain? The type of sensation I'm referring to? Well, I felt like I got run over by a truck. I hurt really bad. I don't know how to explain the pain. Okay, is it different than what you are experiencing today, your symptoms? It is not as bad as it was two years ago. It is not as bad as it was two years ago? Right. What has improved? What is different today? I can walk. I take hot baths three times a day to relax the muscles. I do cold packs, take my medication. I realize you do different things maybe to relieve the symptoms. I'm asking what has improved today in your symptoms. I can walk. Okay. Now, I assume that means that when you were released from the jail the next day, you couldn't walk out of the jail. Oh, yes, I did. So you could walk. Yes. It was the next day that when I got up, I started losing feeling in my legs and my arms. So you're talking about October 10th? Yes, October 10th. Because you got out of jail October 9, about 1 o'clock p.m.? Right. And you walked out, and these symptoms started up the next morning? Well, no. When I walked out, I was real stiff, and I just hurt all over. Then what happened October 10th? Well, I was taken to my medical doctor. And then the next day, I went to work because I was still a little freaked out about what happened. The next day, meaning October 10th? Yes. And I was sitting in the office, and I started losing feeling in my legs, my arms, left side of my face. I couldn't talk because this side wouldn't work. I talked funny, and it scared me because I didn't know what was going on. So you went back to the doctor again? Monday, I did. I went to Dr. Darst on Monday. Okay. That's when he started treating you for these symptoms? He did a thorough examination and then started treating me. Did he tell you what was wrong with you? He is a chiropractor, and he has done study with orthopedic, too. But he is not a medical doctor, is that correct? Yes, he is a medical doctor. Well, do you know the difference between a chiropractor and a medical doctor? I figure if the medical, what is it, American Medical Association, they're off of chiropractors. So I figure they're MDs too. So you said your spine was twisted and what? It was like twisted and compressed. So was he able to relieve that condition? He has been working on me for two years. So he got me so I could walk. I walked like a little old lady. When you went in? And now you can walk normally? Yes. What else has he improved over the time that he's been treating you besides your walking? Trying to keep my spine in alignment. Has he been successful in doing that? Yes, but it goes out real easy. How often does it go out? I really don't know how to answer that question. In other words, you can't tell when it goes out? No. As far as you know, once he gets it all back in place, does that stop all of the symptoms of the Okay, we'll get ready for your second 200 test. Mrs. Noblet, Noblet, Mr. Ivy, Black Hawk Services, Long Meadows Park, Sandy Knowles Apartments, Airport Mall, Long Meadows, and Sandy Knowles. And this is going to be 200 Q&A number two, and it starts in the middle for five minutes, okay? You have been endorsed as an expert witness. 
is what you have told me here today, what your opinions are as to the custom and method of removal for snow and ice? That is. Okay, you have also been designated to testify as to November 30, 1988, the day of the accident and the slip and fall of Mrs. No Noblet. What did Mr. Ivey request of you concerning November 30, 1988? Mr. Ivey requested that I go back through my records with Black Hawk Services to possibly look up any possible service that we did on November 30, 1988. Okay, what did you find? I went back through the time tickets on November 30 of 1988. I found that we had sanded two places and I found another time ticket where one of my truck drivers made a, made a note of it, of the conditions. You sanded two places? What two places did you sand? One was Long Meadows Park. Another one was Sandy Knoll's apartment. All right. In November of 1988, around the 30th, how many different clients did you have, if you know? I don't know how many clients we had at that time. I can assume or guess that we had pretty much the same clients in 1988 that we had last year. So how many total would that have been approximately? Approximately four clients. So of those four clients, then two of them, 50% of them called you for Sandy. No, I am misleading you on that. We had four clients. Of these four clients, one client had many properties and another client had many properties. Another client had few properties. All right, then maybe I should ask you how many properties you were doing in 1988, November of 1988. If you will allow me to give you a range, I would range it between 12 and 20 properties in 1988. That's fine. And of those 12 to 20 properties, you were called to sand two of them? That's correct, two properties. All right, and one was Long Meadows Park and the other was Sandy Knowles Apartment. That is correct. Where are those located? I have no idea. Long Meadows Park is real close to a high school. Which is north, south, east, west? That is the east side, mid-east. Okay. Approximately. Where is it in relation to this airport mall parking lot that we are talking about in this case? Airport mall would be a mile and a half or two miles south. Where is Sandy Knowles' apartment? I don't remember where Sandy Knowles is. I would have to look that one up. Okay. Is it your understanding maybe that it would be close to Long Meadows? Not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily. I believe it is further south, but I don't know. We would have to look that one up. If it would be further south of Long Meadows, that means it would be closer to Airport Mall? I'm assuming that. I don't know. Okay. We had a note on the ticket where the operator or driver was not doing ice control, but he was traveling from the main control center, which is approximately two to three miles south of the airport mall and a little bit further east. And his notes on the time ticket was, travel to the yard on sheer ice. That was between the hours of 3.30 and 4.30. PM. PM. So in the afternoon. In the afternoon is when he made the notation. Was it nasty in the afternoon? Apparently it was. Any notation from anybody as to what it was like closer to noon or late morning? Well, noon is when we mobilized the sand trucks for Sandy Knowles and Long Meadows Park. Okay. So if we mobilized it at 1245, that means we had to have the call somewhere around noon or prior to noon. So generally from about the time of the call to mobilization is 45 minutes. Could be up to an hour, hour and a half, depending on the situation, what it takes to get ready for it. And you have no record or notation that you received any earlier calls on November 30, 1988? No, I have no notations other than what I found on the time tickets. Is it common for your drivers to ask about road conditions like this one did? A good driver will, yes. And why do they do that? We pay our people by the hour. We have no time clocks. We have nothing but their word on what they did that particular day. Their signature is what we pay them on. So was this driver who made the notation one of the ones who was working on the Long Meadows or the Sandy Knowles project? No, it was not. A different driver. Just driving to the lot? He was driving back to the shop and a non-Sandy unit, not snow removal unit. Was he driving a Black Hawk service vehicle? Yes, he was. Why was he driving it? Was he on duty at the time? He was on duty at the time. He was on another project, working on another, another project. And from the time they shut down on the project to the time he drove back to the yard is when he made his notation of the road conditions. But do you have any idea what project he was working on since you only said there were 
these two that you called to work on that day? I am talking about two completely different projects. One is a snow removal project. The other one is a different project unrelated to the snow removal. So this is just another business entity of Black Hawk Services. This was another part of the business. Another business project? Yes, project. Then it didn't have We'll get ready for your 180s. So on your 180 test number one, you have Ann Loy, Norton, Kansas, Ann Valley Hope Association, God, A, B, alcoholics, alcoholic pancreatitis. And this is gonna be 180 number one for five minutes. Sorry, y'all. Let me just change the batteries. We ordered all those, right? Mm -hmm. Here we go, 180 it starts in the middle, you all, five minutes. I want to make sure that I understand your opinions and your conclusions with reference to Anne Loy. You've reviewed the medical information given to you that you've described with reference to her abuse of alcohol. Right. And you've read her statements about what she's done, how much she's drunk, how much she's abused alcohol. Well, I don't have a specific statement from her other than the people's recordings of what she's told them. Right, that's what I mean. Statements to the interviewers at Norton, Kansas. Right. In rendering your opinion, how much do you think she drinks? And arriving at this opinion about her problem. The longest I've seen quoted here is about a seven year drinking history beginning from age 17 when she started drinking and she was 24, I believe, when she got into the hospital and said, look, I'm drinking too much. I'm having blackouts and so on. Okay, how much are you assuming she's drinking? Five years of heavy alcohol is felt by most people to be sufficient to give you pancreatitis on an alcohol basis. The question is the quantity. Right, what quantity are you assuming she's drinking? One can't tell. She reports drinking multiple kinds of alcohol. There's some suggestion that it's intermittent. Intermittent. Most people describe their drinking as considerably less than what they actually do. It's not necessarily because they are lying to you, although sometimes they are, but in general, people lose track if they're drinking fairly heavily. I think that she probably is within the range that you could expect a person to develop alcoholic pancreatitis, given that kind of history and not knowing the quantity. That's right. You still will say that, not knowing that quantity, as you've just said? All you can do is take the history and try to put it in a ballpark that is somewhat traditional, and that's around 80 grams a day. 80 grams of alcohol a day is a pint of whiskey. Now, that's fairly heavy, and that puts you as a pretty heavy drinker. 80 grams a day over five years? That's right. That's the level of alcoholic indulgence that you feel would be required to give you a solid diagnosis of alcoholic pancreatitis? Most everyone will agree that it's sufficient. The reason I say that is because of the variability we see in individual responses to alcohol. Not everybody that drinks five years at 80 grams a day will have anything wrong with them. But generally you will say it takes around 80 grams a day over a period of five years for a person to abuse alcohol to the extent they will start suffering alcoholic pancreatitis generally? Generally. That's the starting point. And then you have fuzzier areas on either side of that. Let's get on with this 80 grams a day. Is this an average of 80 or does a person have to drink every day? Or how does that work? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Alcoholics usually drink daily, but they don't drink the same amount every day. I mean, clearly no one sits down and says, okay, this is my daily quantity. 
It's a variable amount. You have Anne's records at Valley Hope Association when she checked herself in to resolve any kind of alcohol problem she had. That's right. Wouldn't you think somebody would be truthful with their therapist? She may be telling the truth. She may be underestimating because she doesn't remember what she did. If she's drinking to the point where she's having blackouts, there's no telling which amount she drank on those days because she can't remember what she had because there's no definition of a blackout. You don't know what happened from time point A to time point B many hours later. God knows what's happened. In rendering your opinion, how much are you assuming she drank and does drink and over what period of time? You have to remember, I'm not rendering an opinion she has alcoholic pancreatitis. I'm rendering an opinion she does not have traumatic pancreatitis. I understand. I guess I'm really trying to pin you down here and you're not letting me. I told you once, I'll tell you again. I don't have a number. I can't give you a number. All I can say is five years of heavy drinking and then to finally come in and seek help for it, that sounds like what I see as alcoholic pancreatitis. Are you saying she may have alcoholic pancreatitis or she may not have alcoholic pancreatitis? There's no way I can make either diagnosis as an absolute certainty. You could or you could not label her as alcoholic pancreatitis. It would be acceptable since she fits that just as well, or it could be chronic. Just tell me what you are assuming in your opinion, how much she is drinking on a daily basis. Just tell me. No. All right, let's keep it at just these five years. How much you are assuming she's drinking over these five years? Just tell me how much in quantity. I don't have that data. You have no inkling? All I have is that she says she drinks and there is no quantity stated. How about an educated guess? I still can't give you an answer. No opinion? I can give you an opinion that she does not. Okay, and so um, we'll get ready for your second test, 180. Mrs. Bain, Baines, B-A-I-N-E-S, Nautilus, on the job hyphenated. This will be then. One eighty number two for five minutes Q and A. Okay, starts in the middle. What is your philosophy with respect to the length of time that you will continue to provide chiropractic treatment to a patient without there being any significant improvement? In other words, do you have any rules of thumb of which you exercise here in your practice about how long you will continue with treatment if? it does not appear to be improving the patient's condition. That's a tough question. My philosophy on treatment is as long as I feel there's a sign that treatment is needed for something that I can offer, I will continue to treat. And usually if I'm seeing improvement, then I will continue to treat. Well, if a patient continues to come back week after week after week, month after month, year after year, with the same complaints, do you continue with your chiropractic treatment? If that patient is showing improvement in what I'm doing, yes. If they are not, I will usually send them somewhere else. Where do you usually send them? That depends on the condition I'm treating. So in other words, if a patient feels a little bit better after a session here in the office, even though that may not last very long, you will continue to provide that kind of treatment? Yes, the patient is benefiting from the procedure. Of the patients you have right now, what is the longest period of time you have treated any of them? In other words, who has been treated the longest and what period of time are we talking about? I can't think of anybody offhand. There may be a couple of patients, including Mrs. Baines. She is probably one of the longest patients I have seen. She is probably one of the longest? Probably. Are you still seeing her at the present time? I saw her a few days back, yes. How frequently do you see her now? She comes in when she feels she needs it. She is hurting or she needs some care. Basically, you are giving her relief at the present time. That's correct. There's no improvement in her condition from what you can tell. At the present time, she is failing to respond as well as she was when she was doing the prescribed exercises we wanted her to do. I'm sorry, run that by me again. She was improving quite well when she was to do an exercise program that myself and other doctors prescribed for her. 
She wasn't able to continue doing those and she stopped improving. When did she stop with that exercise program? I don't know exactly what date that was. Whenever they told her she couldn't do them anymore. Who is they? I believe it was the insurance company. What type of program was she receiving? I recommended a general rehabilitation program, light weight lifting. Something she can do on her own? You have to be in a club or something where she can go and have the facilities and equipment needed. Other than having the access to the facilities, is it something she could do on her own? Yes. What was your understanding about why she had to stop going? She couldn't afford it. So she had a membership somewhere and then it was stopped. Right. She was given that on a trial basis, I believe. Exactly. What type of exercises was she supposed to do? Light weight lifting. In other words, simply exercising with light weights. Yes. Weights on the hand? The Nautilus routine. Light weights as opposed to heavy weights. Anytime you need to look at your file to answer a question, please feel free to do so because I'm going to ask you some questions about records that you have got there. I know from the records I received from your office that you first saw Mrs. Baines on 12-31-83. Is that correct? And I will note for the record that the date of this deposition is 12-5-87. That was the first time I had seen her. <laughs> Why did she come in at that time? At that time, she was having some neck and shoulder discomfort with numbness in her fingers. At the top of the sheet I am looking at, which I believe you have in front of you, it has a date of 12-31-83 on it. Yes. It mentioned occupational policy something, and then there's words written underneath it. What are those words? One year. She had been a policy examiner. The second word is on-the-job tension. So. In other words, she was having physical manifestations of job tension when you first saw her on 12-31-83. No, sir. What is the significance of the reference to job tension? Under occupation, I'm not concerned too much about the type of work they do as policy examiners, more than what postures they are really in. In this particular case, it is desk work, and she also stated she has a lot of job tension. So basically she had aches and pains in the upper part of her shoulder, back and neck. Is that a fair statement? That's correct. Did you attribute that to any type of trauma? She mentioned to me that she had had an automobile accident in 1973. Did she have continuing symptoms from? Okay, you all, that concludes your tests. Good luck. They were a little tough, but if you want to type them up for a daily or see how you did, very important, okay? Have a great day.